I'm thankful to be before you once again on this beautiful Lord's Day. I would like for each of us for the next couple of moments maybe to set aside what we're holding and look at our hands. Just look at your hands. Think about all that they've done throughout your life. Consider the years of play, the years of work, even so far this morning, what you've done with your hands. Thinking about my hands, you know, I've only been on this earth for about 30 years. But being the biggest of the four siblings, you need something heavy moved, boy, will take care of it. We had a ranch, we had a little bit of a farm. I've picked up many a turkeys, many a sheep, many a goats. Had to wrangle some cows or fight against them anyway, not, not too extreme. Pulled many a weeds for our gardens. Picked the vegetables, picked the fruit. Carried those buckets of water with what they call miracle Grow in it. Sometimes that worked, sometimes it didn't. But either way, the work was put into it. Now whether or not you have the same history with your hands, that doesn't necessarily matter. Either way, we use our hands to perform various tasks. We use our hands to greet others. How many times did you use your hands to shake someone else's hands this morning? And even with some people, we use our hands to communicate. Our hands are a big part of our daily activities. Now when we look at our Savior, Jesus the Christ, it is interesting to note the different ways that he used his hands. You think about his trade. He was a carpenter. Because of this, you think about how rough his hands must have been. I, I don't have as many calluses as I once did, but I did have them. I still have some of them. Instead of fighting off sheep and goats and picking up heavy objects like tractor, tractor implements, I'm now picking up turbochargers, diesel fuel injectors, and for half the day, typing on a keyboard. So they don't see the same type of strenuous activity as they once did. But as a carpenter, especially during the first century, you think Jesus had gloves? You think he had special creams or lotions to use on his hands if they got hurt or a little too rough? You think as a carpenter, he moved heavy stones into place for buildings? You think he might have ever experienced getting a splinter? As a carpenter, he would have hewed timber to make usable lumber. All of these different things by using his bare hands. In fact, it was with these hands that we find in John chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, where he overthrew the tables of the money changers. Thus, these were not weak hands. We see that his hands were still gentle. His hands were indeed powerful. And his hands were wounded. So the next few moments, I would like for us to study the hands of Jesus. First, we note that his hands were healing hands. The people to whom he spoke brought their sick to him. In Luke chapter 4, verses 38 through 40, 
It reads, And he arose out of the synagogue, and it entered into Simon's house. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. And now when the sun was setting, all they had, or all they that had any sick with diverse diseases brought them unto him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Similar sentiment in Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. We see in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13, that Jesus healed the centurion's servant. And the second count of Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law, Matthew chapter 8, 14 through 16, uh, we find the reason for all this healing in Matthew chapter 8, verse 17, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. It is because this healing ability that he is also labeled as the great physician. Matthew chapter 9, verses 12 through 13. So the hands of Jesus were healing hands. How can the Christian apply these principles? After all, we do not nor cannot possess the miraculous healing powers of Jesus our Savior. However, we can use our hands to help others, to heal others emotionally and spiritually. We can help others to understand their worth to their creator, that is, Jehovah God. Psalm 8, verses 4 through 8 says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. And has crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou, putst, thou hast put all things under his feet. All sheep and oxen. Yea, and the beasts of the field. The fowl of the air and the flesh of the sea. And whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. Though we as humans are lower than the angels. It says we have been crowned with glory and honor. Mankind has been given dominion over all of physical creation. God thought enough of us, not only that, to, but to send forth His Son to the earth and ultimately die for us. John chapter 3 verse 16. As a result, those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, by the blood of Christ, are to teach others, others the same saving gospel that they themselves obeyed. The same love that Jesus extended to us, we also must extend to others, and that is agape love. Possessing this agape love pushes us to want everyone, every soul, to be saved from their sins. <coughs> this is accomplished only by belief in the deity of Christ, repentance of, or repenting of one's past sins, confessing Christ before others, <coughs> and ultimately being baptized for the mission of sins. Just because Jesus is no longer here in the flesh does not mean his healing power ceases. That is done by us through teaching of the gospel. The hands of Jesus were and still are healing hands. Secondly, his hands were helpful hands. And this is in the same vein as, as being healing. But we see that Jesus was helpful. Looking again at his trade. He had a servant's trade. He was helping others. Whether to construct buildings, to repair buildings. He was helpful. 
we see this helpful attitude and the compassion that he had for those around him. Matthew chapter 15, verse 32, where he feeds the 4,000. Then Jesus called his disciples unto him and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting, lest they faint in the way. You see, they had been there with him, learning the things that he was teaching for three days and had nothing to eat. Our Savior had compassion on these people. He had sympathy and he had pity on this great multitude. Now this coupled with his action by providing for them shows us that he was indeed helpful. This was seen in feeding the 5,000 as well. Matthew chapter 14 verses 13 through 21. This attitude is also seen when he washes the, the feet of the disciples. John chapter 13, verses 4 through 15. And we know from Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that it was a common thing for Jesus to go about doing good works. As Christians, we too are called to do good works. This is one purpose of Christ's sacrifice. Titus chapter 2 verse 14. Speaking of Jesus, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So not only was our Savior helpful, but he expects us to be the same way, to have that same attitude of helpfulness. These good works are to be seen by others so that God can receive the glory. Matthew chapter 5 verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now, seeking the glory of men is not the motivating factor. We are to be doing good and by doing that good people will take note. And as we just read, they will glorify God as a result of that. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, we're called to do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. We can discharge this obligation by caring for those who might be destitute of family. James chapter 1, verse 27. We can do so by prov providing for those daily needs that some might have. Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 through 40. It can also be done by bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. says there, against such there is no law. It's not illegal to be nice to people, to bear out the fruit of the Spirit. We can see this helpful attitude in the account of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 37. The list can go on and on of the different countless ways that we as Christians can help others. It only takes our action in order to do that. The opportunities are there. We must take them. Third, the hands of our Savior were nail-scarred hands. You see, Jesus the Christ, our Savior, went to the cross of Calvary and was then nailed to it. Even after his resurrection, the nail prints were able to be experienced by the senses. John chapter 20, verse 24 through 28. There it reads, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, 
Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, My Lord and my God. Regarding the crucifixion, consider the following article from Azusa Pacific University that is titled, The Science of the Crucifixion. And this is written by Dr. Kathleen Schreier. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians between 300 and 400 B.C. It is quite possibly the most painful death ever invented by humankind. The English language derives the word excruciating from crucifixion, acknowledging it as a form of slow, painful suffering. The accused needed to be nailed to the patabulum while lying down. Now this patabulum, that's the cross member. This had to be done while they're lying down. So Jesus is thrown to the ground, reopening his wounds, grinding in dirt, and causing bleeding. They nail his hands to the patabulum. The Greek meaning of hands includes the wrist. It is more likely that the nails went through Jesus' wrists. If the nails were driven into the hand, the weight of the arms would cause the nail to rip through the soft flesh. Therefore, the upper body would not be held to the cross. If placed in the wrist, the bones in the lower portion of the hand support the weight of the arms, and the body remains nailed to the cross. The huge nail, which would be seven to nine inches long, if you think about that, seven to nine inches long, damages or severs the major nerve to the hand, which is the median nerve, upon impact. This causes continuous, agonizing pain up both of Jesus' arms. Once the victim is secured, the guards lift the patabulum and place it on the stipes already in the ground. As it is lifted, Jesus' full weight pulls down on his nail, nailed wrists and his shoulders and elbows dislocate. Psalm 22, verse 14. In this position, Jesus' arms stretch to a minimum of six inches longer than their original length. Normally, to breathe in, the diaphragm must move down. This enlarges the chest cavity and automatically moves air into the lungs. In order to exhale, the diaphragm rises up which compresses the air in the lungs and forces the air out. As Jesus hangs on the cross, the weight of his body pulls down on the diaphragm, and the air moves into his lungs and remains there. Jesus must push up on his nailed feet, causing more pain in order to exhale. In order to speak, air must pass over the vocal cords during exhalation. The gospel accounts note that Jesus spoke seven times from the cross. It is amazing that despite his pain and agony, he pushes up to say, forgive them. Luke chapter 23 verse 34. While these unpleasant facts depict a brutal murder, the depth of Christ's pain emphasizes the true extent of God's love for his creation. Teaching the physiology of Christ's crucifixion is a constant reminder of the magnificent demonstration of God's love for humanity that was expressed or expressed that day in Calvary. Again, that is an article from uh, Azusa Pacific University, The Science of the Crucifixion. With all these things in mind regarding specifically the crucifixion, it can be correctly stated 
that those nails did not keep Christ on the cross. His love for us did. After all, we know from scriptures that he willingly went there. He allowed his life to be taken as a sacrifice. Matthew chapter 26, verses 53 and 54, and John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Due to this sacrifice, we ourselves are able to be healed, able to receive salvation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 2, or chapter 2, verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. This is done by obeying his gospel, ultimately being baptized for the mission of sins. First Peter chapter one, verses eighteen and nineteen, Revelation chapter one, verse five, as well as chapter seven, verse fourteen. It is in that very act of baptism where those who are qualified contact symbolically the blood of our, our Savior, Jesus the Christ. <clears throat> Fourth, we see that the hands of our Savior were and are inviting hands. As the Savior of mankind, his hands were, in fact, inviting. This can be seen in the account of Jesus walking on the water. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 14, verses 26 through 29. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And Jesus said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Peter requested to walk on the water and to, and to come to Jesus. Jesus invited him to do so. We see that Jesus also invites those who labor. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come unto me. The invitation is given. Jesus being the Savior of the world, His hands are still inviting today. We see in Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 23, that Jesus compares the kingdom of God to a great feast. Again, Luke chapter 14, verses 15 through 23. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. So that servant came, excuse me, verse 20, and another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out 
quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. You see that many were invited to this great feast. Unfortunately, only few came by comparison. Unfortunately, this principle is still true today. A similar invitation is offered in Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. The invitation is offered each and every time the gospel is preached. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Mark chapter 15, verses 15 and 16. And Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47. All of mankind, then, is invited to obey the gospel. However, as we've said, the vast majority will give excuse. Fifth and final, the hands of our Savior will be full of judgment. That is sentencing it was foretold that the Savior would also bring judgment or sentencing upon the world Matthew chapter 3 verses 11 12 John the baptizer said that Jesus would eventually baptize with fire I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance but he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will truly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This unquenchable fire refers to Gehenna hell, the eternal abode of the wicked. Mark chapter 9, verses 43 through 48. Revelation chapter 20, verses 14 and 15. When Jesus returns in the sky, he will take vengeance by use of fire. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Hearkening back to the, the great feast that which we read about moments ago of Luke chapter 14, the following sad promise was given. Verse 24, For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. You see, those that were bidden, those who were first invited to this great feast, those who gave excuse, those who chose not to take the invitation to be present at this feast, they will not taste of that supper. Those who reject the gospel's call to salvation have one thing that they can look forward to, and that is the eternal punishment when this life in the flesh is over in Gehenna hell. Now coupling Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29 with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 through 11, we're given quite a terrifying warning. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29 says, For our God is a consuming fire. And 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 10 and 11 say this, 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. As Christians, we know the terror of the Lord. After all, He is a consuming fire. And He has promised that those who do not obey His will will be cast into eternal hell. They will be punished throughout the rest of eternity. This should be a motivating factor for us as Christians, not only to keep ourselves pure and unspotted from the world, but to also help others do the same by obeying the gospel. Now this morning we have studied the hands of Jesus. We have considered the different things that he did in his life, his ministry on this earth. We've noted that he used his hands to heal others. We considered his helpful attitude. We examined his death on the cross, his nail-scarred hands. And by those hands, he brought us salvation from our sins. We have also considered some of the ways that, by which he did those things different examples that showed how he used his hands. We have considered the judgment that he will bring back when he returns in the sky, keeping in mind that he will never set foot on this earth again. Knowing that he will return, are you ready for his return? Are you prepared? After all, we all have been invited to this great feast. Will we take the invitation? You know, next door, and since it's the last Sunday of the month, we have what many call a potluck fellowship meal. Everybody's been invited to that. We don't mind going next door and getting us a plate of food. There's not anything wrong with that. We enjoy fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. But what about when it comes to the invitation regarding the gospel to those who are lost? You spurn the invitation to those Christians who are not living as Christians. What do you do with the invitation? You sit idly by and let those words go in one ear and out the other. You're making excuse. And any of us can become guilty of that. But that doesn't mean it's right. Are you ready for his return? As it said, his fan is in his hand. He will baptize with fire. The chaff will be burned up. The wheat will be gathered. Now, if you're not ready for his return, we have mentioned earlier what was necessary and what is necessary for you as an alien sinner to put away your life of sin, to be converted, and ultimately become a Christian. Why not take the next few moments to become one this morning? Yet as a child of God, have you strayed from the straight and narrow path? Again, Matthew chapter 14. Jesus walking on the water. Jesus knew the source of this power said, If it be you, Lord, bid me come, and I will. Jesus offered the invitation, and Peter came. But sometimes we as Christians can be more like Peter in verses 29 through 31. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? You see, Peter got distracted. He took his eyes off Jesus and was more worried about his surroundings. 
Sometimes we as Christians can do the same thing. The difference between some of us as Christians and Peter is he cried out, Lord, save me. If you need to be restored as a faithful child of God, come. If you as an alien sinner need to become a Christian, come. Either of these needs can be met if you choose to come forward as together we stand and sing.